checking that our checking that our live stream is on. <clears throat> Looks like we're good to go. I'm just going to do a quick test on some of these other technical details to make sure we're streaming um, out to the wide, wide web. We've got a live webinar here on Zoom for the conference attendees. And uh, that means we'll be able to do things like chat and um, question and answer. I'll try to keep an eye on, the, on that window um, <clears throat> as we go on. We've got half a day. So I figure we'll do um, about an hour and 15 minutes, hour and a half for two different sections. We'll take a little break in the middle for biology. And um, I think we'll get started in just a second. I'm looking for my green light and it looks like we're all collected. So let's see, go back and make sure this is live. And I want to make sure that we've got the slide set there. Okay. So let's see. We're on our way. It's about nine o'clock Eastern time. And I've got a bunch of slides ready. Um, if you want to go to this URL, which is on the page here, metagrid2.sv.vt.edu, tilde n polis slash capital VR 2020, you can get to uh, PDFs of these slides. And I think it'd be great for you to have them locally because we'll be looking at lots of um, examples and applications and authoring approaches and this is the web so everything's linked um, and I hope that you will follow along um, as we go so I'm just going to quick pause this a second Looks like everything is going. Um, so I know there are people on the Twitch stream. I'd love to see some attendees here in the uh, in the Zoom meeting if you're there. So, so good morning. My name is Nicholas Paulus. I'm a professor um, down here at Virginia Tech. So I am on the East Coast. Was going to have a great trip to Atlanta this week. So I'm really missing out to see you all. But I hope you're doing well and staying safe in these challenging times. Of course, there's no better time to be learning about Web 3D and how we can connect our 3D worlds and our content and users all through basically the biggest computer system on the planet. There's no bigger market than the web. And uh, when we think about having impact with our work, our content and our research, um, that's kind of where I'm looking, right? It's one thing to, you know, make a, a, a theme experience and we go, we'd get to do that here. I'm actually broadcasting from the Visionarium lab. So this is my lab. We'll, we'll take a, a look around a little bit later. Um, but, you know, there's only so many users that you can get uh, with on-site or... Um, you know, exhibit style uh, VR. And so being able to put that content out to the web increases its reach, increases its impact, its collaborative value. And so I get really excited when I talk about this technology and it's really what got me here, got me hooked uh, back in the late 90s. So I'm gonna swing it over to the slides. Again, I wanna make sure you all um, can follow along. So, here is the slide deck. And I just want you to see the um, address there on the left. You can download all the presentations that I've got here for our morning session. Okay, so I'll leave that up for just a second. Oh, there's Kyle. Hey, Kyle.
How you doing? <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Excellent. So it looks like I'm live and uh, I just started to um, uh, roll into my content here, but I'm seeing there's some folks on Twitch, but not necessarily in the webinar. Should I be seeing Yeah, I think it's, uh, it's pretty common that you're just going to find that people are going to be over in, the, in Twitch and watching on there. And so um, the information for the Zoom is getting posted, but uh, so if people have questions, they can do that. Um, there's okay. also the Slido uh, page. Okay, um, Slido page, or should I be looking at that somewhere? Yeah, um, so the Slido link uh, should actually be um, here. Let me just go ahead and post it in your, uh, in your feed here. Okay, that's great. So if, if you go there, there's a Slido, uh, which uh, for your tutorial, if anybody has any questions, they can ask on there and you can monitor okay. that. And right, I see. And I will send you the information for uh, doing that moderation. All right, great. I see a little web page with my um, with a QR code, and it says Web three D tutorial. Yep. Okay. So, as people, if they're asking questions, will they come up like a feed on that? Yep. And so, if you click on that other one, you'll actually have moderation access, and so you'll be able to see all of it. Okay. All right. Good luck. Um, so more people should be joining soon. Yeah. Any um, uh, guidance about a start or just sort of whenever you feel it's right? Yeah. Whenever you feel it's right. I think um, there's uh, make sure you're monitoring as well. So you actually have a, so yeah, Gabriel is over here and uh, we can elevate him to a panelist. And so if you look at your participants uh, list, um, yeah. basically just remind people to raise their hands when they come in, if they want to be promoted and have video. Okay. Okay. Gotcha. All right. Good luck. Take care. All right. Thanks, Kyle. You too. Yep. Bye. -bye. See ya. All right. Great. So we've got some guidance from headquarters and, um, I'm just kind of trying to line up all of these different feeds and make sure I'm trying to stay aware of all of this stuff. Okay. All right, great. So let's go uh, back to the slides and we'll kick off a, a quick introduction and then get into uh, get into the meat. Well, I'm a vegetarian, so it's not a really great metaphor. Um, but let's see, share slides. All right. So uh, welcome everyone. Uh, who's online and maybe you're still in your pajamas. Uh, so we're missing, missing the face to face here, but um, a great opportunity to uh, some, try some new technology. And I'm here to talk to you today about uh, the web 3d standards and specifically about extensible 3d. Um, this may be one of the best kept secrets on the web. Um, it's certainly, uh, as you'll see, something that I'm passionate about here on the front image, for example. Uh, you can see our 3D Blacksburg environment. Uh, is, this is the same file, uh, which is built from SketchUp models, GIS data from the town, the state, federal. It's a mashup of like four different data sources pulled into an X3D environment. and that same file can be accessed on my handheld phone, a laptop, touch screen, my projection cave, which is behind me here in the Visionarium lab. So I didn't recompile anything, right? I didn't maintain four versions, one for each platform. What I'm talking about is the actual content of the 3D models and their interaction. 
And Extensible 3D lets us describe all of that in a standard way. And so I'm going to move on. I want to make some acknowledgments, of course. If some of you may have uh, seen uh, this similar tutorial was offered in uh, 2018 in Rutlingen. And you'll see a few slides from uh, my collaborators poking up here. But I wanted to first quick thank um, Johannes and Timo over at Fraunhofer IGD for um, supporting um, the content here in this tutorial. And also Uwe Wassner uh, from HLRS. If you were at Rutlingen last year, you also were hopefully able to visit his lab and you'll see a lot of the amazing things that they're doing over there and incidentally doing for the last 20 years um, is based on the technology that we're talking about today, X3D and VRML. So I wanted a quick shout out to those folks and uh, say thanks um, if you're out there listening. Cheers. So a quick thing about me, I'm hoping that you all are looking at this slide deck locally. Remember we have metagrid2.sv.vt.edu till the end polis VR 2020. So I want you to have these slides because um, you can follow along and we're on the web here. So we're linking to all kinds of resources, content, examples. I'd have to say probably the, the biggest value of this tutorial is going to be in these links that you take off and uh, can then explore on your own. All right, great. So I'm getting a little uh, green light here from uh, one of our moderators, and uh, I think we're good to go. So we'll keep on it. <clears throat> I just wanted to uh, maybe do a quick introduction about myself. Um, you know, I am uh, here at Virginia Tech. I run the Visionarium Lab, which is part of our high performance computing group or advanced research computing group. I've jo joined the lab in 2002 and uh, took over the lab in 2006. It's been a great mix of research and application and using immersive media and X3D and VRML really across all kinds of applications and domains and data sets. And so that's really what I'm gonna give you all a sense about here today is about why standards matter, okay? And uh, some of the values that they bring. And um, one thing I'd like to say is, you know, I'm coming from, I built my first interactive 3D world in 1997. We were still there at HTML 3.2, I guess, 3.2. Um, and it was a very different world, but it was exciting. And, you know, I put a lot of effort into that, uh, those worlds. And I'll show you an example later, in fact. But um, the biggest thing that I wanted to do was to make sure that that world didn't just disappear into the bit bucket. And so this idea that my content needs to live a long time, right, is central to what we're talking about today. Is building 3D content's hard, it's expensive. But it's even more difficult and expensive if you have to do it twice or three times over because your last uh, company changed the API or was sold and disappeared somehow. So I really look at the durability aspect, and that's important. Um, if you are doing research, uh, this stuff has to be reproducible well beyond any Silicon Valley company's life cycle, right? Uh, reproducibility is hard in this field, uh, but what I'll show you is um, with a little bit of planning and consideration, um, you can run, you'll be confident to run stuff in 20 years, like I've been able to do here. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. You can follow up on the, um, uh, 
on those links if you're interested in more about what we do at ARC. We're going to see a lot of examples of how we use X3D technology across virtually every college and institute. Okay, and that's what's exciting. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna, I've got a quick question here to write the link. I'm going to post that there. The slides are uh, in this folder and they're numbered one through four. We're just starting on slide number one. All right, great. So sorry if I am getting distracted a little bit. I am trying to monitor the chat and, uh, and make sure that everybody gets um, the best experience out of this new platform. Okay, so that's a little bit about me. Um, uh, again, my mission here is to enable researchers, educators, students um, with advanced visualization technology and VR, AR, MR. And uh, in order to do that, I can't be um, the master of every application in all of those fields. I need a greatest common denominator. And that's what these standards like X3D provide. So that's what I'm going to show you today. And here's a little view of what we'll be covering today. Okay. So first I want to kind of give a real overview of X3D technology. Some of you may or may not have heard of this. As I said, it's sort of one of the best kept secrets on the web. And I'm happy to have a discussion with you all about why that might be. But conspiracy theories aside, uh, this is a robust, proven international technology. And if you're in computer science and doing VR, it's absolute, or even if you're a web developer, it's essential that you know about the standard scene graph, okay? Every tool has some variation on these ideas, uh, but if you know the standard, as you'll see, you'll be able to take your content across all kinds of applications and platforms, and that's really the power of a standard. So we'll do a technology overview. I want to talk about um, the ecosystem, because as I said, this is a mature standard. There are lots of tools uh, out there, and I want to give you a sense of some of them, what they were built for, what they're good at, what they might have limitations about, right? So that'll be a valuable section there about the ecosystem. Uh, hopefully we'll save you a lot of web searches and let you get right to what you're interested in. Then uh, we'll do a quick break for you know biology reasons and um, come back and look at the range of applications. So seeing that, oh wow, there's this whole world out there on the web of you know, 3D models and content. Uh, how do I use it? What can it be used for? The application section will really give you some insight into all of the ways that um, that you can use X3D. And then we'll use the last bit of the section to try to give you some authoring tips. Um, so I know that it's, uh, we only have a half a day and you'll be excited to try some stuff and get the exporters out and your text editor at the ready. Uh, but we only have a half a day. So what I'd like to do is uh, that last section about authoring. Um, I really just try to provide some top level hints and again, some resources so that you can go out and um, experiment and author uh, on your own time. Okay. So let's go back to uh, a little bit about what, where this technology comes from. What's the deal? Uh, since some of you may not have heard of it before. But actually, um, it's quite a, a mature technology. We've been present in this conference, IEEE VR, for over a decade, um, organizing workshops and participating in workshops. And so if you've been at any of these over the years, um, 
mixed reality interface specification back in 2006. Uh, the workshop called Future Standards for Immersive VR, 2007. The Cirrus workshop, which is still running today. Um, in 2008 and 2009, I made the uh, assertion that, you know, really the only way to kind of compare across different softwares is to see how they implement the same thing, right? Uh, for example, a, a standard Steam graph. Um, medical virtual reality, this was a great um, event. There's still some slides online you can find of this. Uh, Henry Fuchs and Nigel John and some of the big heavy hitters in, in medical uh, came together and we launched into a, a really exciting branch of this that is uh, we'll see later about volume rendering, health records, things like that. Um, volume rendering uh, was a hot topic in 2013. And then uh, we had a great uh, series of workshops on immersive analytics. And of course, in 2016, I presented uh, in that workshop. Everything in those presentations and everything you'll see today in terms of graphics is X3D content. Okay, so this, for example, image right here uh, aired on a Microsoft Azure commercial some years ago. Actually, I saw it in a hotel in Greece, uh, but it was for Compute the Cure. That's Professor Wu Fang. He's looking at a MPI blast results of a gene sequence query. Okay, so we reconstructed the results of that query and gave him an environment to kind of page through the different strands and uh, figure out what base pairs were the same and different. Okay, and you know, every year we've been at SIGGRAPH, we're at supercomputing. Um, so if you look for X3D and VRML, it won't be hard to find, let's put it that way. But we have a great history here with this conference and we would love to, uh, we're really happy to be back. Okay. So uh, you don't have to take my word for it. <laughs> um, there is a huge, huge literature uh, on this technology, the applications of this technology, the extensions of this technology. Many of it, much of it is in the computer science literature, but surprisingly, you're going to find this in astrophysics, in uh, literature, right? Um, uh, even military literature. We're going to find that X3D and VRML are really being used for all kinds of things, and it's not really visible until you start digging. Okay, so I really hope you will uh, do these searches yourself, prove it to yourself, uh, that there is a, a huge set of resources and a huge community uh, that uses this technology. Um, even if the game companies don't want to let you believe that. All right, what are we talking about? Oh, well, we're talking about Web 3D. And uh, let's talk about that as a general term because um, some of the literature you might have seen talked about a Web 3D quick start. We're focusing a little more on X3D, but basically what I'm talking about is if you use any kind of uh, What's the key for the web? It's about URLs and about linked data. And if we can use that kind of linked data in our interactive 3D worlds, we have a huge vista, a huge horizon of possibilities. And that's what uh, we're gonna do today. So just a couple of examples on these images. Again, everything that you're seeing is X3D. Uh, here's our 3D Blacksburg uh, environment again. At our science fair, kids three to five years old pick up the game controller, they're flying all around catching frogs. Um, that accessibility is really exciting. Here's a web VR uh, version. This is back in the Oculus Rift uh, era, but with a leap motion and Oculus Rift and web VR. So that's running in a browser. Okay, no special install required. And that's kind of the exciting. Thing, but when you start to look at um, the impact that your content can have if it was able to be shared 
across the web, this is the realization that really the web is the interface, right? And it is for the future. Um, it means that it runs, you can get to the web on any of those operating systems, you know, any of those hardware platforms, any of those browsers, right? They're all reading the web. So we think about <clears throat> putting 3D content on the web, then again, we have this huge vista kind of opens up before us. Um, all kinds of data are served and trafficked over the web, right? So here's some examples, uh, which um, except for two uh, are mine, but we'll see some more about them later. Here's a, a GIS-based uh, environment of our nature center uh, here at Virginia Tech, our sustainability center. Uh, where we looked at trees and reforesting certain areas. Um, DNA stretching, the physics of DNA stretching. High order mathematic functions, we'll look at some of those later in applications. 3D printing, CAD parts, okay? All of this stuff is lives on the web. And if we could just wrap it in uh, the right kind of language, Right, we could access it, we could compose it, we could build worlds out of these different you know, media fragments. So that's kind of one of the key things about X3D and VRML is that they were built with the web in mind, okay? So the same way that an HTML page says, hey, here's an image and I want you to link it to this address, it's the same thing with, uh, with X3D and VRML markup. You say, okay, here's a cube, here's an image texture, it lives at this address, and if you click it, hyperlink to this URL, okay? So that's really at the core of all of this stuff is that it's built for the web platform, okay? HTTP requests, uh, URLs, all are things that you get to take advantage of in this environment. So we'll talk more about that uh, later. So it's been uh, wonderful to, um, to be part of this uh, movement. And it really is something that has been going on uh, for decades. Uh, in fact, the ACM SIGGRAPH conference called Web3D uh, is going into its 20th, 25th year. And that's been really exciting to watch that. The whole story is in the ACM Digital Library, right? But if you look at that big history of stuff, and it's same with the Google Scholar or Semantic Scholar searches, you'll really see that there are people from all over the world that are using, contributing, uh, web 3D content. And we've also been able to see, if you look at those proceedings, that dozens, scores even, of graduate students and uh, product prototypes have been built uh, by extending these standards. Okay? Um, so they're extensible. And of course, this fact that these are all running uh, 25 years later is no small feat. Okay, so I'm going to take a quick second here to check all of my various things, the chat, the Q&A, okay, looking good. All right, so it's important to talk about um, standards a little bit more because um, <laughs> I mean let's see. I mean let's face it like standards are not that sexy you know in fact uh, they're a real pain you know you've ever been in a committee that's trying to design some technology you know it's not easy um, and you know I mentioned HTML 3.2 you remember how long it took us to get to HTML5? That's the W3C, right? 
standards um, take a long time. Uh, which is hard for our attention span these days. But there's good things about that, which is that they work with a form, formal process. Okay, this isn't just some developer in some you know shop deciding that this is how it's going to be. Uh, it turns out that with standards, you get to have lots of perspectives lots of suggestions, and you've got to work through the pros and cons, all those trade-offs, and get to a spec and ratify it. So let's talk about um, some of those organizations. I mentioned the World Wide Web Consortium. That's uh, a major one, right? If you're a web developer, you're probably looking at those specs quite a lot. And there is a great effort going on over there in terms of um, Web XR which we'll talk about a little bit later. But let's talk about ISO, actually, because not a lot of people think about ISO. You might see it on a truck going down the road. Oh, it's ISO 9000 certified or something like that. ISO is the International Standards Organization. It is uh, an international group with formal uh, procedures and, and working group structures, committees, and so on. And it covers everything. So <clears throat> if you are, for example, using the MPEG standard, uh, MPEG is uh, ratified by ISO. Uh, X3D and VRML also ratified by ISO. What does that mean? Well, it basically means that you have this formal procedure. The document has a life cycle from a committee draft all the way up to an international standard. And along that timeline, you have national bodies reviewing and voting on the technology. Okay, so what does that mean? If I have X3D and VRML or an ISO standard, oh, you mean experts in France, Germany, Korea, US, like, you know, Sweden, they all looked at the standard and they approved it with, as a national body voting saying, yes, this is a standard and uh, we'll observe that. So you don't have that with really any other technology out there uh, for 3D graphics. Web3D and X3D are ISO standards. National bodies have voted on them, okay? World Wide Web Consortium and the Web3D Consortium, which we'll hear a lot more about, they are member-driven also. Um, <clears throat> and also have formal procedures for their, for their content, uh, for the technology. All right, so let's keep going. Let's dig into this a little bit more. Go back to the slides. All right, so extensible 3D, as we'll see, is really a suite of standards. It's a set of standards. And the most important ones that we're gonna focus on are the abstract spec and the abstract scene access interface, okay? So when we talk about a scene graph, uh, well, I'll define that and explain some more later, that same scene graph can be encoded in lots of different formats, right? It might be in a binary format, it might be in an XML format, it might be in a JSON format. It's the same thing as an image, pix, uh, you know, a set of pixels with RGB values. Uh, if you assume it's lossless, it's the same thing as having a picture encoded in PNG and JPEG. Okay, it's the same uh, RGB range and values, uh, but it's encoded differently. Okay, so that's what we're talking about a scene graph that can be expressed in multiple languages and manipulated in multiple languages. And we're gonna kind of consider it as the general, the abstract scene graph, okay? So what's really one of the big benefits about being built on the web and in the, with URLs in the DNA of the, of the spec is that now stuff from all over the web can be composed, and uh, reused, and the scope of the standard really covers the stuff you would expect, like objects and appearances and uh, 
environments, uh, animation. But one of the things that we'll continue to see here is that X3D and VRML are really a level above a lot of the formats today because they describe not just that here's a nice BMW with a car door, but that when you click the handle, the door opens. Okay, the interaction is actually described declaratively in the file. Okay. So I would maintain that that car door should open the same way, no matter what platform I'm on. Maybe I'm, you know, touching the car handle with a mouse pointer. Maybe I'm picking it with a raycast. Maybe I'm touching it with a pinch on a HoloLens. Doesn't matter. It's still getting touched. What happens? When that, when that uh, event gets triggered. Well, we'll talk about how X3D and VRML can carry this kind of interaction information. All right, so I tried to make this uh, parallel earlier and I, I still think it's useful. So we're talking about a declarative language, just like HTML, okay? X3D has um, a hierarchy, parent-child relationships. Um, it can point to uh, resources out at URLs. So if you want to use that image over there as a texture or that sound file or that movie texture, you can address them through URLs. The same way as HTML5 can be viewed on lots of different engines, so can X3D. Remember, it's declarative. It's not compiled. Just like HTML, uh, you can script your 3D worlds with JavaScript. And with all of these aspects, it's really exciting because what I'm seeing is that, yeah, there may be, um, okay, let's, let's be generous and say that maybe, um, maybe there's 50,000 OpenGL developers in the world. I don't know. How many web developers do you think there are? People who know document object model and JavaScript? Several million, orders of magnitude beyond that? Well, all those people can do 3D now, okay? And that's really starting to change how we look at building content and, uh, and sharing it. All right, so I'm gonna go back. All right, so we'll do just a, a little bit of background here again. Um, talking about extensible 3D. And we'll see some more history slides here in a second. But essentially, X3D is the successor, the forward compatible version of VRML, virtual reality modeling language, also known as Vermal. Okay, so if you look at someone and they say, oh yeah, that SQL database, you mean the SQL database? Same thing with VRML, Vermal. Uh, it, you'll see that set of specifications, it does mean that it's a file format and a runtime API. So if I wanna reach into my 3D scene and put a listener on a, you know, that light switch or that car door, um, I could do that in Java, in JavaScript, and some other languages that are, are coming down the pipe. We'll see, and that's through the API, the runtime. Talked about that you can encode the same scene graph in multiple encodings, still equivalent. Uh, but we had to also upgrade. VRML, uh, Vermal was, did not have things like shaders uh, at the time. It was the late 90s, right? We were still in the fog, uh, shading model. And uh, so X3D really brought forward a lot of new graphics innovations into the standard. And uh, it is extensible, as we'll see, uh, through these certain semantics of uh, scripting and prototyping. All right, so kind of a, a big picture here of the history of the standards. Uh, you know, going back to Vermal 1, Vermal 1 did not have a behavior graph. That means that 
there were no animations or interactions or sensors in that language. It was just a transformation graph. So you could build these static worlds and fly through them. Um, Silicon Graphics, incidentally, uh, pulled a lot of ideas from its inventor standard, uh, and those are go into uh, verbal. Somewhere here, 96, 97, that's sort of where I got involved. Um, and we added some geospatial support to the X3D specification. We added some character animation, uh, sorry, to, to the verbal specification. And uh, what we found was that we, this technology was really powerful and exciting, but we needed to have some kind of not-for-profit body to develop it, protect it, shepherd it, um, so that it didn't just become the domain of, of one company. Uh, and into the 2000s, we started to see the rise of XML. So uh, the Web3D Consortium started to look at how do we describe 3D worlds in, with XML, and we'll see some of those examples today. What I think was a big turning point at least for me, was the recognition in 2008. Uh, you can follow this uh, link if you want to the paper. Uh, but was a bunch of the experts in the field, you'll recognize some of the names, looked at the technology and said, okay, is there anything in X2D or VRML that says uh, this is for desktop only, or that this is a mouse? And it turns out there's not. Um, so the standard really is ready for immersive content. What we um, developed here at this workshop was basically a strategy to how to drive device data into the scene, how to render it with multiple windows and so on. And, uh, and, and that's kind of been a turning point for us, uh, at least here at the Visionarium Lab. Okay. So I want to make sure that you have these links. Please feel free to hop off on and off with different um, different examples. But there is a book here, uh, the Extensible 3D for Web Authors book. <clears throat> if you're a student in the library, you probably can get access to a digital copy you know, through your library uh, if you wanted to do that. There's also slide sets and models that go along with that book and we'll see some of them as we go on uh, all along today all right so i want to get a couple of things laid down about x3d and verbal so far we're uh, looking good here i don't have any questions on the chat so it looks like we'll keep going. All right. So far, so good. Thank you, Ivan. <laughs> Appreciate that. All right. So let's go. Uh, all right. Yeah. So Gabriel, sorry. Um, I'll keep pasting this in. If you maybe if you get in, uh, you can't see what happened above you. That's possible. Great. All right, so a long history, but I wanted to uh, at least give you some sense of that. And to again, this kind of set our minds onto what's the problem, the scope of this problem that the standard is trying to solve, okay? So basically, when we're talking, same with HTML, right? I think the metaphor still holds is that we're building applications uh, up at this higher level, right? Where we have some markup and some scripted logic, and maybe we'll be going back and forth between the servers and different kinds of domain models. But we're above, right, all that low level rendering stuff. And that turns out to be a really big boon um, for all of our applications. So a quick thing about terminology, okay? The scene graph, and this is true um, 
for any tool or technology. Basically, a scene graph includes two different things. Okay, the first thing is the transformation graph. Okay, so that's like the hierarchy of objects, where are things located, right? You're used to talking about translation, rotation, and scale as different transforms. Okay, putting things where they are in the world. That's one, the transformation graph. But we also have the behavior graph. So this is a map of how events flow in the system. So you remember my example of touching the car door starts an animation to open the door uh, or switching the light bulb, the light switch turns on a light bulb. Those, uh, the way those events flow is called a behavior graph. And it's uh, central to uh, X3D and verbal. So here's another kind of view of that. and. Um, We'll get to these links later. Uh, don't pay attention to this stuff on the right. But I just wanted to kind of show you the layer diagram, another, another way of looking at it, uh, which is that X3D is kind of sitting here um, where you can use DirectX, you can use OpenGL. I've seen X3D renderers that do Pavre, honestly. So it doesn't really matter the rendering layer. Uh, again, we're working at the next higher level up. And we'll see when we have uh, WebGL, the kinds of things that become possible. All right. So in general, the scene graph has a lot, all the stuff that we need to define our 3D world, right? Lights, cameras, where are they? What color are they? What's the field of view? All of this stuff we want to be able to specify. And we can in our scene graph. Um, where are the objects? What do they look like? Uh, what's the environment like? So the scene graph is basically a data structure that gets traversed for drawing. And every time step that it's traversed, we also evaluate our behavior graph, which is known as the event cascade. Okay. All right. Something practical. Uh, what's the difference? Well, if I wanted to draw a red cube and I was working down at the level of those renderers, right? Uh, I would need 83 lines of compiled C code to make a red cube in OpenGL. Okay. So what's, what's going on there? Well, that's the classic trade-off. It's like, okay, I can get really low level and have some really amazing power with the graphics card and the hardware, but I've got to compile that and it's got to be specific to that hardware. Uh, I need a special development environment and library, so on and so forth. I'm responsible as the developer with OpenGL to manage all my triangles, all that stuff. But if I'm just building an application, I don't really want to worry about all that stuff. I want to work at a higher level. And so the declarative way of doing that red cube, as you can see in X3D, is quite simple. This is our XML encoding. Uh, and so that's the difference. The scene graph. Here's kind of an example here on the right. And um, uh, maybe I'll point out a few things about um, the properties of this scene graph specifically for X3D and, and VRML. So we have a parent-child relationship, right? A hierarchy. And that's important because if we're doing things like scoping our lights or scoping a sensor, we're going to want to pay attention to um, the hierarchy, right? Maybe I want my light to only uh, illuminate things in this room but not in the other room. Right, so we might have two different branches here. Well, here's a, an example um, that's pretty common, which is maybe we have uh, two different objects in our scene. They look different. Let's say there's a, you know, a red widget and a blue widget. They have different appearances, but they share the same geometry. That widget. Okay, so with the standard scene graph, I can do things like this, like name and reuse pieces of my world. So you could imagine um, 
a large building like our art center, there's 60 rolling chairs in one of these rooms. Do you think I wanna put the rolling chair model in my world 60 times? No, I'm gonna define it and reuse it, okay? So that's what's going on here. We can reuse geometry. We talked about the scene graph, and the key thing about this, I also say, I'll bring it up again, transforms. Anytime you see the word transform, if you're a coder, you ought to be thinking four by four matrix multiplication. Okay, that's what it is. It's just a, another matrix on the stack in, in, in OpenGL terms. But uh, you'll see what it looks like in a declarative sense in a few minutes. So that's the, scene, the transformation graph. What about the behavior graph? Ah, okay, well, let's see. If uh, the user clicks this widget, this widget has a sensor attached to it, okay? Let's say they touch that widget. Uh, an event will be generated that can be routed to uh, the light and make it turn on, okay? So there's these things called routes which make up our behavior graph. I'm sending an event from this sensor right to this light. We'll see some more examples about that. Digging in. Uh, this honeycomb image provides uh, one or two points I'd like to bring up. So I mentioned that the X3D spec is abstract, okay? Well, that means that that same scene graph set of nodes and relationships, content model, can be described in XML, in a UTA-8 classic verbal encoding, in a binary, and we'll see how this is filling out with some other things like JSON, HTML5. So on the left side is our, the encodings of X3D. On the right side is the scene access interface. And that API, which I mentioned, the runtime API, we can bind that to all kinds of languages. Okay, the ones that are ISO and ISO approved right now are JavaScript, ECMAScript, and Java. But the Web3D consortium and its memberships are bringing some new ones uh, out this year, which uh, we'll talk about later. Okay. So that was really the main thing about that is that there's an abstract spec that, that can be encoded in different ways and manipulated with different languages. So events throw through the system with routes and these routes are evaluated every frame. Okay. And so if we're doing keyframe animations or maybe we're uh, using some script logic, um, right, to process uh, something like for a game, for example, or some other kind of application logic. Uh, we might use scripts, but this behavior graph is a map of how events flow in the world. All right. So we're assuming that uh, the ISO standard, that um, spatial units are meters, X3D does have a unit statement in its header, um, which can be very useful if you want to maintain precision, or you want to be able to, for example, uh, pull in that one world which was in centimeters and put it in with this other world that's in inches, right? You can actually put those models together if you know what their units are. So X3D provides a formal way to declare that. Our angles in these standards are in radians, okay? So that's just one thing to know. And we're doing a right-hand coordinate system. So what you're seeing down here at the bottom was, uh, we did a fast forward at SIGGRAPH. This is one, two, three, four, five different runtime engines loading the exact same X3D file, which is from a CAD part, and it's animated. You know, it animates when you click it. Okay. So by having that, again, that standard, I could look at that 3D model in Firefox, Chrome, Explorer, right? It's the same kind of idea. I'm building the content once, and the engines take care of application specific stuff. 
I'm going to skip that with the exception of one thing I'd like to point out here. When we look at the um, encodings for uh, X3D, if we are um, using things like XML, the XML encoding, all of a sudden there is this huge set of tools that we can use that we didn't have to design or develop, right? So a great example here is this uh, authentication and encryption. If I've got an X3D scene in XML, I don't, I don't need anything else except for the web technologies to zip, to encrypt it and make sure that only people with the right kinds of authentication can open it. And it actually works on document fragments. So if you wanted to have like multiple levels of detail, right? Uh, multiple levels of detail of a model and only the, high, the highest level of detail you need in special authentication for that. No problem. You know, XML and the W3C has solved that problem already. So we don't have to. It's great. So there's another thing about using um, standards is that playing well with others can really have advantages. Right. <clears throat> so we looked at this timeline a little bit. I guess I have some things I wanted to raise over oh, um, here along the right hand side. A lot of activity around a JSON binding. Um, turns out that'll be really cool if we get, uh, and I'll show you some more examples later about how that's really a, a great format for some web kinds of applications. I mentioned these other API bindings of JavaScript and Java, but inside the Web3D consortium and ISO, the ISO pipeline, we actually have uh, C Sharp, uh, binding with a C++ and a C binding and also a Python binding uh, which is being specified and standardized. So I'll tell you how we can get all of these to uh, to stay synchronized and valid and uh, that'll be a secret till later. <clears throat> okay it's called a unified object model. All right so if I have a whole bunch of, if I have some verbal content and I want to make it into X3D, uh, no problem. I can actually do something very simple, which is change my WRL extension to X3D V and change the header. Okay, and now I've got an X3D file in the classic encoding. Okay. So when we went from from verbal, we added a bunch of features, right? And uh, the XML and binary encoding were, were some of them. Uh, also adding support for shaders and multi-textures. So we did a bunch of graphics uh, improvements. We added uh, rigid body physics to the specification. We'll get to look at some of that. And also uh, support for distributed interactive simulation. So a quick note about this, uh, if you haven't heard about DIS, um, it is uh, a simulation uh, interoperability layer that's supported by NATO and many of the military uh, groups from our, our respective countries. It's how they communicate for tactical and, and the simulations right so if i had a for example the naval postgraduate school runs an online exercise and there's 20 tanks you know 14 helicopters some airplanes some people on the ground they're all in a 3d world they're all um you know launching artillery and whatever at each other the way that those worlds communicate and stay in sync is this dis standard okay so in a lot of cases, it's overkill for our multi-user type of, you know, simple second life sort of worlds. But if you're talking about real deal um, networked graphics, the DIS standard is something. Uh, incidentally, uh, Professor Steed's book on networked graphics 
as a whole chapter and exercise about how you can use DIS and XDB together. Uh, some new things coming out. Just as a heads up, we'll see some more about the standard activity uh, is that we're doing some new bindings, HTML5 encoding, and we're uh, integrating GLTF and physically based rendering in version 4.0. All right, so I'm going to take a second here and um, just kind of show, let you take a look at these MIME types. But I think we should probably take a look at this, um, these examples here. So one of the things that I'll do, actually, I'm going to take Hopefully you can see the screen. Make sure it's sharing the right thing. Okay. All right, looks good. Um, so I'm actually going to go up a level uh, here. So the Web3D consortium maintains these archives of different models, and they're really, really useful. Um, the reason that I, I'm going to go to this X2D for web authors, remember that book that I mentioned before, um, you go to X2D for web authors, you'll see a whole bunch of examples broken down into the chapters. Okay. So let's just take a look at uh, one of these, for example, maybe uh, event animation. And... Oh, I don't know. Uh, I'm just loading this example. Okay. All right. So what are we looking at here? So this is, all these examples are auto-generated, okay, from an archive of X3D files. So there are x3d xml files and every night the jenkins server goes through and it builds a website with the latest uh, with the latest models and transcodings right so you know i mentioned that the same x3d scene can be uh, encoded in multiple ways right so these are all the different encodings for this world, which we're getting a nice little preview here in the, in the window of an animation. Well, let's take a look at what's in a .xml, a .x3d file. We have our classic header information, right? We're pointing to a, a DTD and a schema, okay? So if you're not familiar with XML, these are the documents that constrain what is a valid seed. So if you thought about um, the uh, correct um, syntax of X3D, that's going to be described in the DTD. And if you think about the correct semantics of an X3D file, that's in the schema, right? What kind of nodes can go where, what data type is legal, etc. Okay, so that's what's being done here at the top. You'll see we have an X3D a uh, tag and some head information where we can keep metadata about the world, right? The author, the license. Okay, that's great. That's going to travel with that X3D file no matter where it goes on the web by attribution. And let's go down to the scene. Okay, so let's see. We've got um, some viewpoints. Right, which have orientations and positions. They're looking at, at the world. So there's one, there's two. Basically, in uh, X3D, there's kind of a convention. If you use page up and page down, you can sequence to different viewpoints in the scene. Okay, so I'm just doing page up and page down right there uh, to hop between these viewpoints. Okay, here's our cone. Gotcha. There's the cone, that green guy. Uh, there's a floor. Okay, there's the box. 
and then our uh, animation data. So let's look at this here is, you know, I talked about our behavior graph. There we go. Some ECMAScript that's in there. Okay. So in all of these, let's go back up to the table of contents, all of these examples um, are available in these multiple encodings and <clears throat> uh, visible right here as pretty printed or you can download the different formats different encodings okay so that's pretty fun so i'll get into more a little bit later about this preview and the talk about excite and x freedom uh, these happen to both be actually uh, HTML5 based browsers. But I wanted to make sure before we got too far that you were able to see, okay, what does this scene graph look like uh, under the hood? What's the source look like? And the fact that it can be expressed in all of these different encodings. Okay. All right, so we did a little visit here of the Web3D example archive. And I'm going to use this opportunity to just check the chat again and see if we have any kinds of questions or anything coming up. Looks like we're good. <clears throat> so I want to make sure everybody has the uh, link to the uh, slides because I do very much want you to follow along. So I'm going to go back to the chat and make sure that everybody can see this URL who wants it. And please download it and follow along uh, with the links. Okay. So the uh, the good news about this is uh, hopefully you're seeing that um, there's this huge world of ISO standards out there. There's a huge community of people, and the, a lot of them are based around their uh, importance of durability of their content, portability of their content. I don't want to make it twice or five different versions of it and uh, the interoperability of that content. I want to be able to use it with this application, with that application, okay? So the Web30 Consortium is, is the not-for-profit group that, uh, that does that. And I want to thank all the members out there uh, for all of their support over the years. All right. So I'm going to wrap up this first section. It went a little bit longer. Uh, than I wanted because of our uh, our new technical platform here, but I think we're we're getting on a roll. And this first kind of section was a technology overview, a kind of to help show you guys, you know, why it is that Virginia Tech in my lab uh, participates in the international community and the standards. Uh, it's because our stuff is still running 25 years later. We didn't have to recompile anything. Uh, Sun, Silicon Graphics, all those companies are gone. Our stuff still runs. So uh, being able to kind of look at an enterprise scale and, and graduate from 3D is not just about a wow factor anymore. It's about integrating with enterprises. And that's where uh, X3D shines. So I want to go to the, uh, to the second slide deck which is called ecosystem let's see uh, da, 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 da. just give me a second here we go ecosystem got it all right so let's share that Uh, 
All right, excellent. So give that a second to come up. <clears throat> Hoping that it does. All right, so we're at the ecosystem uh, slide deck. So I mentioned about kind of the enterprise approach to VR and graphics and the fact that we've been built on the web uh, with URLs in our DNA. The Verbal and X3D standard uh, really provide a lot of advantages. So I'm going to kind of run through a few right here. Uh, summary. I mentioned that we want to be able to run these models in 20 or 30 years. Otherwise, if we can't reproduce this, you know, science uh, and research is, comes to a stop. But certainly our, our company, our application uh, is going to be out of business uh, by then. So we want to be able to use and reuse our 3D content over the time span of decades. One of the things that really drives us to, as we see all these different tools, um, is that when we get to focus at that higher level, the application layer and the scene graph, X3D and VRML, we don't have to worry about all of that stuff like the rendering layer and um, implementing uh, an event cascade and all of these callbacks and so on. It's part of the standard, right? And so there's all of these engines or the systems layer that we want to have it support the X3D functionality. And that means when, we, when it comes time to build applications, it's very easy. We don't have to worry about, right, taking, keeping track of every triangle or where we are in the matrix stack. Or, or mallocking something, right? You don't have to worry about it at all. You're just worried about the application level logic and the flow of information at the application layer. So knowing that, and uh, knowing that 3D user interfaces are uh, nowhere near being standardized, um, we also kind of recognize that at the application level, you, level, you might be uh, driven or compelled to you know, make a certain version that runs with the gamepad and another one that runs with the ART tracking. That's fine, that's at the application level. I don't wanna to have to have my authors or my domain experts worrying about uh, every triangle. So this only happens because of the standards. And uh, here's just a quick a uh, set of logos of folks that the Web3D Consortium is working with. We mentioned ISO and the fact that these standards are internationally ratified by every national body in ISO. The Open Geospatial Consortium, uh, World Wide Web Consortium, Kronos, the OpenGL, WebGL folks, uh, Health Level 7, your health informatics, and DICOM, your medical imaging standards. So X3D and Verbal is virtually the only technology that I know of that uh, really crosses all of these boundaries, all of these domains, and tries to make sure that the 3D graphics uh, is compatible with all of these standards. All right, here's the takeaway, which we, uh, which I mentioned at the end of the last one. Okay, so I mentioned about this 2008 workshop, uh, 2007 at VR, and I kind of think of that as a turning point, again, because we sort of, we all looked at the standard and we said, you know what, there's nothing that's just about a desktop here in the standard. We could use X3D in caves, head-mounted displays, leap motion, you know, uh, and so how do we do that? And we began to um, develop this strategy, which now you're seeing sort of the, the fruits of, wow, 12 years later. Okay, so here's kind of a fun example about that durability story. So 1997, I was, 
I guess I was just a year out of college and uh, working with a small startup. And we built uh, a 3D version of the Giza Plateau in Egypt. You can kind of see here. Uh, oh man, this was the day of uh, 14 four modems. Okay. Um, we didn't have GPUs at this time. And so we took a lot of care in optimizing our scenes. This whole uh, environment, including the textures and animations, came in under like 600K. Okay. And it needed to because it was going over a 14 4 modem. All right. So there's lots of fun things in here. There's some you know, animation, some information about our bands and music and, and so on and so forth. But what's really cool is that world that I wrote in 1998 runs today in my cave, by, right behind me. Let's see, we go here. Uh, we'll fire this thing up after the break uh, on some of the application examples. But, um, I didn't change a thing. That file from 1998 was written in Vermal, now runs on a cluster, a rendering cluster, connected by uh, GPUs, excuse me, um, four GPUs on a 10 gig line, 27.8 million pixels, Linux operating system. Like I had none of that in 1998, right? but still I can load this content, right? So this is the kind of content that's unfortunately, you know, a lot of the studies that they did with pilots uh, in the 80s and 90s that were built on proprietary SGI hardware, you can't repeat those experiments, sorry, to run them from scratch again. And that's a problem for economics, but, you know, it's also a real problem for scientific progress. So anyway, the fact that, I had the, the you know, the farthest from my mind was a 27 million pixel immersive room to run this in 1998. Yet, uh, I just uh, loaded it up out of the box and it works. So kind of a testament to that. And I challenge you if uh, even um, a grad student can run one of your other grad student studies from three years ago. Okay, it's a dirty little secret of VR uh, reproducibility. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, let's keep going about the ecosystem. So yeah, 27 million stereo pixels uh, as of our last upgrade. And being able to take that same X3D file and again, all of a sudden put it onto the web so uh, with web vr for example uh, again i didn't have to change anything in the x3d file uh, we get to see this standards content across lots of platforms and lots of different kinds of applications so in the next section uh, we'll get into more applications and you'll see these again Everything from molecules to CAT scans uh, to 3D printing. If you are interested in seeing some of the things that we do here at Virginia Tech, uh, I encourage you to um, check out some of these videos. I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to play any of them, but I, you can see, for example, uh, well, let's play one, I guess. Why not? Um, I'm thinking about this one, uh, the Wing It exhibit. It comes up later in the uh, in the slide deck. But this is a group, a student project. They put up a exhibit in our architecture building. So they designed it all in VR so that they could figure out the space. So here they are in our cube. There's the physical space. And uh, 
they're basically able to use, here's a picture of them inside the cube. You can see there's got an ART uh, fly stick there. We're trying to think about line of sight. Is that, you know, can I read it from here? Is that too big? Is that too small? Is there enough room to fit through the wall and behind the, uh, behind the table? So here we're looking at the virtual model of course, which was they had built some, some parts in SketchUp, but we wanted to take it immersive, and so we took it to X3D in order to put it into our uh, cube. And we'll see this was, uh, I guess I'll just let this play a little bit further. Here's the space before. Here's the space after. Okay. So a little bit more about what we what we do, and uh, and why uh, we're looking at the greatest common denominator of X3D, so that we can pull data from whatever kind of applications that might be, whatever kind of language or tools that the scientist or designer has, get it to this common, greatest common denominator, and then we can redistribute it to all these different platforms. So I'll come back to this, but this is really the way that we uh, generate our interfaces is with uh, auto-generated from the IDL of the abstract spec. Okay, so we're talking about ecosystem here. Let's go to present mode. And I wanted to uh, kind of make one, the main distinction about how I can look at or run or use X3D um, comes down to, am I installing a standalone engine on my machine? So I get the full power of OpenGL, you know, no sandbox, no permissions, etc. I'm installing an application, or I'm going to access that X3D through the browser. So inside an HTML5 browser. And we're gonna look at these um, examples further on uh, as we go. All right, so who loads X3D? Um, so this is just a partial list, in fact. Um, and uh, we're going to go through uh, a couple of these tools and kind of talk about pros and cons. Um, just going to make sure that we're playing here. Share. Yes. Okay, should be sharing. All right, good. So <clears throat> there's no shortage of engines, in fact. And some of these are, many of them are open source. Some of them are from uh, uh, industrial concerns or research groups. Uh, these are the ones that are really active right now. So uh, we'll go through each of them. but. Uh, yeah, let's, let's do this. Go through each. So the first one is instant reality. <clears throat> so this is a industrial strength uh, engine, runtime engine for X3D and VRML. And it's super uh, extensible. Okay. So this is actually the... Um, uh, software that we use in our hypercube here in the Virginia Tech Visionarium Lab. Okay, so you can see it lets me do some things like set up my different screens. You know, the geometry of my screens, are they stereo, are they not? I can render with instant reality to any configuration of screens. It's really cool. What else? Uh, it also provides uh, an API so I can drive my tracker data, et cetera, into it. 
it is a industrial strength tool uh, from Fraunhofer IGD. Uh, it's a free version. It's for Mac, Windows, Linux. I often have it installed just to test. Um, I do lots of cross-browser testing. And uh, it's a reality is a, is a solid runtime. And it gives you good debugging feedback. It's a reality. It does uh, show up with a logo unless you uh, buy a license, but it is free to download and install. So yeah, that's how we do what we do here at Virginia Tech. Um, so we've got a set of scripts that uh, define our, the geometry of our stereo windows. We have a data stream coming from our ART tracker. And we've been able to use, you know, even going back to the InterSense and, and other kinds of tracking devices, drive that data into the engine. One of the special things that we like about instant reality, and I, I hope that more engines do this in the future, is it's no problem right now to say draw, use a gamepad and move a viewpoint around a 3D scene but you're not necessarily taking advantage of things like collision detection or terrain following, things that are in the spec, especially in walk mode. So from that IEEE workshop paper, you can read about the strategy. We actually drive our uh, external data streams into the navigator, and that's what lets us do terrain following and collision detection, even if we're in our cave using a tracking system. Yes, it's a really nice uh, piece of uh, instant player. Um, we can take X3D Immersive with a whole bunch of other platforms. I'm going to kind of skip this uh, here quickly. OK, this is another really impressive code base. Uh, and if you were at Rutlingen in 2018, um, and you went over to the HLRS lab, uh, Dr. Vossner's uh, cave over there, you, you saw this software. Uh, these are actually pictures from his uh, lab. Covise, or Open Cover, it was released as LGPL um, a few years ago. It's pretty slick because uh, it loads X3D and VRML. And uh, it also lets you do some things like it has some in-world menus. So you can see here on the image on the right, there's a, a whole immersive menu where you can drive, uh, drive the runtime. Hello? Hey, Nick. Um, I can start streaming uh, from here so that your live stream comes back up. If you just want to stop live streaming, I will pick it up from UGA, and it'll pick up on it momentarily, OK? Oh, did it go down? I'm yep, sorry. it went down. OK. Uh, so oh, just, wait, stop streaming. Yep, and I'll just pick it up from over on our computer. And you should see it. I'll let you know if it doesn't come back up. But otherwise, just continue on, OK? All right, here we go. Let's see, stop live stream. All right. Okay, so let's see. I, I see a question about, uh, about tracking and multi-user setups. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not seeing our stream going back, but I will I'll try to reinstigate that. See if that goes. Uh, okay, so there was a question about tracking and uh, collaboration. Yeah, so that's um, one of the key things about having that behavior graph is how do we handle events in the system, being able to define, okay, the head tracker is giving me these six floats. Um, maybe I better stop that. Huh? Oh, you still there? Uh, I just wanted to verify that. 
Um, I'm, I'm doing it. Never mind. All right. So let's see. All right. Well, thanks, folks, for the patience while we bring that back up. Um, the question about tracking and uh, multi-user setup. So. We will uh, see some of these examples in later slides, um, but with our tracking, um, we did have to do some, some uh, mapping, right, of units and hierarchy. So for example, um, being able to uh, base collision on the users, where the user's uh, avatar is, the body, which is head tracking, but also to be able to do virtual navigation with the fly stick and the mouse, uh, required that we built the, re the proper hierarchy in the scene graph and then that we drove uh, the right data which includes units and radians instead of heading pitch and roll into the scene graph right so there's a little bit of mapping from the tracker stuff the tracker scripts are pushing data into these hooks in the scene graph I'm gonna try to stop live stream again. And we'll see if, uh, okay, so about multi-user setups. Uh, there again, it's, uh, and we'll see this has become especially easy with uh, tools like Node, Node.js, um, for example. Uh, there's older servers like Deep Matrix and some others that basically let you share events across distributed uh, users. And again, they kind of have to be um, the proper units. And they should also, um, also you have to deal with uh, different kinds of latencies and lag. So a good example with the X3D um, event cascade, you know, according to the spec, it is uh, evaluated at every frame, every time step. Okay, but you don't that that's going to kill your network traffic. If every thirty times a second you try to update your position and orientation along with twelve other people, a hundred other people in the room. So uh, I have to say that the, in terms of the multi-user setups, you're going to have to throttle back the, the usual event cascade of what's happening inside the runtime. Throttle that back so that uh, you don't saturate your network. So there's some, there's some trade-offs there. So good questions. Uh, so you're, I up, you're up and running, uh, Nick. OK. Thanks, Kyle. Yep, sorry about that. Uh, no worries. Appreciate it. Thanks for looking up. All right, great. So let's go back, uh, I guess, to our slides. We're in the ecosystem slide. So we we're talking about uh, Covis and open cover. And here again, you can see um, a X3D runtime. VRML runtime, it's installed, it's running with the full power of OpenGL, um, it's integrating tracker device on the system, and uh, it, this is a really excellent um, platform. So we'll see in the authoring section, I think, uh, just all the amazing things that um, HLRS has done with this toolkit. Um, and again, usually it's from supercomputer data. So I want to bring up another one. This is actually another open source project uh, that came to our attention last year. Uh, again, because we have this worldwide community, you know, it's amazing the things that pop up uh, here and there. But uh, this is a open source platform. Uh, from a young gentleman in Scandinavia. He has open sourced it, um, it, including the Unity project that he used to build it. 
It includes a simple X3D parser and loader. Uh, but the thing that I was so excited about this was um, we had a HoloLens one in my lab and uh, we were like, oh boy, wouldn't it be great if we could see some X3D on the HoloLens? And uh, literally within a week, uh, this engine is posted to the public list, X3D public at web3d.org. So, hey guys, check out this thing. I just open sourced it. Sure enough, I could load almost all my models, especially my network visualizations, into the HoloLens, right? Same X3D file. I didn't compile anything, uh, but yet I can now load it on the Vive or the HoloLens. And uh, touch sensors work with the semantic of the pinch. Again, we're not on the desktop. We're not in a flat browser. We're in a virtual world that's hyperlinked and pulling resources from URLs. So I've been really excited about vSLAM, and uh, I hope folks will um, take a look at that and, and consider uh, contributing. Uh, another really phenomenal uh, toolkit is, or engine, is the Castle 3D game engine. And this is from uh, Dr. Cambrellis and his group um, in Europe. They have uh, really focused on building a game engine that's based on X3D and Verbal. Uh, they've focused a lot on the visual uh, quality of the rendering. So the shaders, uh, physically based rendering, environment maps. Uh, the Castle game engine really has some of the most advanced features in terms of graphic quality uh, that we have. What's also cool is if you download View3D Scene, you can load in an FBX and save it out as an X3D. It's pretty slick. Uh, so it is even kind of a, a multi-format engine, and, uh, and you can use it as a converter too. So Castle 3D Game Engine. Free World is another open source Vermal and X3D engine, multi-platform. Uh, what's really cool about this, uh, just to give you a little history, uh, somewhere in the early to mid-aughts, the Canadian government actually funded a fair amount of development on Free World. And uh, Free World has an amazing MIDI interface. Uh, if anybody's interested in doing MIDI work or sound, multi-channel sound, that was all uh, thanks to the Canadian government. Free World is still actively maintained. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, the physically based rendering uh, support was announced. And um, so that's an actively developed code base and also free and open source. There is another, uh, since we are here, uh, at VR. Um, oftentimes this community is uh, co-located with the Haptics conference, but uh, if there is anyone interested in Haptics, you yeah, definitely should check out h3d.org. Uh, and uh, this is from the group at Sense Graphics, also in Scandinavia. Um, <coughs> but it has excellent support for X3D, especially a volume rendering. And of course you can poke and push and pull uh, your X3D models if you have a haptic device. And so using X3D with haptics, uh, I would uh, recommend h3d.org. There's a bunch of other uh, notables that I'll bring up. Um, so, one of them is called XJ3D. Uh, we used this for one National Science Foundation project a few years ago. Uh, it's still actively developed. It's been brought forward to the latest version of Java and um, the latest OpenGL binding for Java. Uh, fully open source, and uh, you can put it in uh, any of your Java applications as a full-blown uh, engine. Very cool. 
uh, Coin 3D is something that's kind of been on and off again the last decade or so, but I, I think there's a lot of potential there too. Uh, it's basically an open source C++ uh, toolkit for Inventure and X3D. Another great uh, tool, I, I like this one also for testing Octaga Visual Solutions. This is, again, a standalone player. It does have a logo, unless you buy a license. The license, I think, is 99 euros, and it's quite nice because it does let you do things like record movies of your VR experiences uh, without losing any frames. So there's some nice things about Octaga VS. It is free, multi-platform, uh, unless you have a license. Uh, it will have a little logo in the bottom right. So it's probably worth mentioning one more uh, toolkit since the last time we were in Rutlingen at 2018. Let me see, I've got something in the chat. Uh, was a, sort of a different time. Yes, okay, so this is great. I'm going to just take a quick second here and take a look at the chat. Yes, uh, that's correct. So, um, yeah, basically you um, have your runtime engine running, and if you have, uh, you know, a VRPN server or something like that, you can just drive that data into the CGRAPH uh, for tracking. And the next question, are any of these engines free for commercial use? Uh, definitely the open source ones are all fair game. Um, I'm not sure what Octaga or Fraunhofer, what their latest stance is. Um, I'd like to tell a quick story here about uh, Gear VR. So folks have maybe um, remember uh, a few years ago, I think there's something like 5 million of these headsets sold actually. Quick, I'm going to quick check this chat again. Uh, excuse me a second. Uh, sorry. Okay, sorry, Gabriel. I'm trying to find your note. Okay, so let's talk about the story about Gear VR. <clears throat> so, you all know that, uh, you know, Oculus was bought by Facebook. And, you know, whatever you think about that, it's fine. Uh, but at least we know that um, China did not want Facebook uh, to be doing business there. And unfortunately, that meant that Oculus and the Oculus Store and the landing pad and all that stuff, launch pad, for Oculus could not be uh, distributed in China. Well, the Gear VR team, incidentally, since it supports X3D, they made the user interface for the launch pad of Gear VR in X3D. And because it didn't use the Oculus Store anymore, they were able to distribute Gear VR in China. Okay, again, the power of standards, power of standards. <clears throat> All right, so I think I just sort of provided a, a rundown of what I think are the most promising, uh, robust um, kind of tools for uh, installing a, an application that then can be your runtime engine for X3D or VRML. Okay, we looked at uh, instant reality, we're ready here. We looked at Covise or open cover, which we'll see some more of this again later. VSLAM, you know, your X3D content will likely be loaded with, uh, through the X3D loader, but this is a, a compiled application that you can download and, uh, or build yourself. Uh, that supports X3D on the 
HoloLens and on the Vive. Castle Game Engine, great rendering, but file conversion, free world, uh, great sound, great uh, support for the standard, haptics, etc. Okay, so that's just a subset of the many uh, engines over the years, but uh, I think they're the most promising ones. So let's talk about that other uh, ecosystem, which is the web. So I'm going to accelerate here because we're um, getting to the top of 11 o'clock and I want to make sure we get to uh, explore a few things. So what does this mean, a shim? Uh, it basically means that you know, if you're in the web browser, uh, that browser, Firefox or Chrome or whatever, doesn't necessarily know X3D syntax. Okay? But if I put in a little shim, a little piece of JavaScript, that does, it parses those X3D tags, it handles the WebGL drawing, right? Now all of a sudden my browser is an X3D browser. And it's only for this idea of a, of a polyfill or a shim that this can happen. So we have two of these. Uh, the first one is XFreedom, is how it's pronounced. This is uh, an open source, you can fork it, uh, DOM API, um, it supports WebVR, which we'll take a look at in a second. And uh, it has a whole set of examples. So why don't we take a moment and look at a few of those. Okay, so now remember, this is the uh, strategy of publishing it in HTML5. So we don't have the full OpenGL. We have a subset. It's called WebGL. But we can do lots of stuff with it, it turns out. Uh, one of the things I always like to show is this one, of course, you know, is that uh, we have divs, we have Z order and layering. Uh, so, you know, 3D Wikipedia, anyone? This is an X3D model uh, being rendered with XFreedom on top of my HTML page. So that's pretty cool. Um, a lot of interactive things. Let me see if I can find uh, another good one. Of course, we can uh, put um, sound and audio into our video, into our textures. So it definitely is deep media. Let's see. Uh, da, 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 render features. I'm looking for. Um, shadows, OK, a mirror effect. I do like this one, actually, too. So let's let's just take a look at this, and I'll show you guys um, something which I really enjoy, which is okay. We've got um, we're in a browser. This will work in uh, Edge, Chrome, Firefox, Safari. Uh, so we're using a shader to make this mirror. Okay, here in our X three D world. Uh, but you also might want to notice this thing down here in the bottom right. <clears throat> so I mentioned uh, WebVR support in XFreedom. Well, indeed, uh, if I, I've got the, I'm in Chrome here, so I'm using a WebVR emulator. But you can see uh, I just went into VR mode, and there's my side-by-side -side stereo. Um, maybe if I wanted to go to some extensions. Let's see if I can find it. Let's go to more tools, developer tools. Uh, go here. Wait. Da, 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 da. I'm looking for my extensions for WebVR. So I can show you. Uh, 
Oh, more tools. Uh, no, I don't see it. Shoot. All right. Well, if a there's a there's an emulator for WebVR that you can work in Chrome. I'm looking for it. I thought it was here, but um, there we go. So I can actually um, you know test as if I had a WebVR device and debug um, debug my uh, HTML5 and JavaScript code. So you can see I can drag my um, view around and change you know, orientation, et cetera. So this is working now with Oculus Go, Google Cardboard, any of the WebVR platforms. Um, pretty slick. So I'll go back out of uh, web VR mode and go back into our web browser examples. Okay, so I like that one. Um, <clears throat> so multimedia transportation, uh, we can do some things within, um, you know, using the web uh, for the things it's good for, right? So See if I go here. Uh, take a look at this car configurator. There it is. My nice white. Uh, this is all X3D, but maybe I want to change the rims. Maybe I want to change the color, right? So I'm able to use my 2D HTML elements and send events in and out of the 3D scene, which is pretty exciting. Um, there's another example of that actually on web3d.org, which I love to show. Let's go uh, forward to one of these, this one, yeah. So large models. If you click on the banner here at web3d.org, you can follow along and then here's a, a link to the, the actual uh, X3D model. So here it's streaming in, it's a rather large model, so it's going to take a second. But it's, it's done pretty nicely, it's, you know, it's got some good sort of game quality textures. Um, it's pretty responsive. Uh, let's see, one of the things that I'll do is, there's my page up and page down. So uh, I should say, you know, one of the, I mentioned um, conventions for X3D. Right now we're doing page up and page down to jump from viewpoints to viewpoints. If I'm in examine mode and I click and drag, and it's kind of like spinning things around in my hand, examine mode, I can always double click and reset my center of pivot, okay? So I'm double clicking there, recentering my center of pivot. All right, so let's take a look at this shadow here. Um, so right up here, um, in an overlay, in a regular HTML widget that defines the sun position. Uh, I can scroll this to evening. You can notice my real-time shadows. Or scroll it to noon, back to morning. Okay. So again, 2D and 3D content living together, living on the web, using what you know about web programming to do 3D graphics. And you're not dealing with OpenGL, triangles, and compiling. You're really just concerned about the objects and the information in your application. So we've been looking at uh, X3DOM examples. Thought we could mention this since both of these uh, platforms support uh, GLTF uh, inlining. So, uh, but so here's X Freedom again running in an X3D scene, and there's you know one of the classic PBR models. It looks pretty good with some roughness and some metallic things going on. You know, it's got an environment map. I can go into WebVR version if I want. So that's great. <clears throat> and we'll talk a little bit about, um, and when we get to the authoring section, about GLTF and, and 
where it has a place. Uh, they call it the JPEG for 3D. Okay, so that might be something to re remember. Uh, the other uh, HTML5 runtime is called Excite. And Excite is uh, from a group in Germany. And they put out actually a, a, an editor for X3D. It's based for, it's for Linux. But it lets you do all kinds of slick stuff, uh, animations, um, debugging. Here's your behavior graph. Look at that. You remember how we were talking about sensors and uh, building interaction in your X3D scene. So yeah, I, I love the GLTF and stuff, but when the user clicks the door handle, the animation should start. When the car is driving, the wheels spin, right? That's true no matter where this car ends up on the web or what application it's used in, right? And so we describe that at the level of X3D, and it can be, uh, uh, and then it's portable. So a lot of features in Titania, uh, and I really encourage folks to take a look at that. But I want to go over here to Excite and um, take a look here. Um, they have a set of examples here. Um, again, this is a little piece of JavaScript that makes our browser understand what X3D is. So let's pick something here like, uh, I like this one actually. So here is a, again, we're rendering in WebGL. This is an X3D model, but we are um, modifying different environment textures. Uh, we have interactive control over some shader parameters. Right. So I can, you know, ramp up the speed here a little bit. Maybe the frequency. It's, look, it's looking really like hairy out there on the water. Let's calm things down a little bit. Okay. This is all in my web browser. Uh, the a, a neat thing um, I'll also say is that recently they started to support volume rendering. And I've got a section on this later uh, in the authoring tools if you wanted to uh, figure out how we do volume rendering with WebGL and how to author this kind of environment. OK? So two different JavaScript polyfills, or shims, let you put your X3D right in the browser lets it talk to events in the page, right? Events can go in and out. Uh, one of the things that I might um, like to say is that if you want to, <clears throat> for example, think of how this is done or any of the examples in on the other sites, you know the web developer's favorite secret weapon Yes, you do. Control U. Control U. Oh, yeah, baby. What's the source look like here? Oh, well, okay. I got some HTML. I know about that. That's cool. Um, some other JavaScript functions. Okay. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Look. There's some X3D right there in the web page. Oh, yeah. Cool. It's got some stuff like a background and a light and a viewpoint. And then here, it's pointing to an X3D file URL. OK? So that scene, this scene, right, including the slider with the shadows and so on, control U, look at the source. How does it work? Right? So I encourage you to do all of so here's two different functions about the sky color and then one about um, uh, the waves, to generate the waves. That's what those scripts are.
But Control U is, uh, yeah, is your best friend. And um, I would, as you go through the Excite and X Freedom examples, I definitely encourage you to uh, check out the source, see how it works. Okay, I'm gonna go quickly through uh, the rest of this slide set. I really wanted to introduce you to the engines. Really wanted to show you, hey, look, there's a bunch of different ones out there. They have sort of different pros and cons. Um, but maybe I will spend a little time actually about um, uh, X3D and GLTF, because some folks might have heard about GLTF. Uh, GLTF, as the Kronos group says, is the JPEG for 3D. So it's lean and mean, and it, it exists for one reason and one reason only, which is to take large coordinate arrays, typed arrays, from the web somewhere, and to be able to stuff them into my GPU without parsing, okay? So I want to be able to take that big bag of coordinates, and indices, and normal maps, normals, whatever, you know, it's coming over the wire. Uh, it might be binary, uh, but I don't need to parse it at all. I just throw it to the GPU. And so it's really efficient and it's really great for um, moving around certain kinds of assets, right? But GLTF does not have uh, native lighting in it. It does not have interaction in it, okay? Um, so what's kind of the point I make in this blog, and you can, I'm happy for you to uh, follow it and, and send me your, your comments, um, uh, is that basically, yeah, we, we love GLTF, but we need a full scene graph. Right? We, need, we want our stuff about level of detail and uh, about interactions and the animations uh, that go with the model. Okay, so there's a place in the future for both of them. Uh, and uh, I think we're going to see with X3D 4.0 that, um, you know, you'll be able to use GLTF models and then add all the good stuff that you want on top of it, the logic, uh, animations, interactions, et cetera. Okay, so I just wanted to bring that up as we want to play well on the web. Um, and if you're doing X3D, please, please, please don't put spaces in your file names. <laughs> okay, ecosystem. This, uh, I'm just gonna toss this out there because it's uh, a relatively new um, thing. Okay, let's see. I'll go to uh, the questions here. And we'll go to Byron, uh, best engine for PC and mobile cardboard visualization. Okay. So in that case, um, uh, yeah, if you're really looking to do cardboard, um, then I would probably look at uh, X Freedom because it has that web VR uh, built in. And so it's very easy for someone to go to a web page, either with Google Cardboard or um, something else uh, on their phone, and tap the little goggles at the bottom right <coughs> and go into, into the world. Um, so when we're doing web VR or web XR, I think the best thing right now is uh, X freedom, so that would be one thing. Um, I also had a question about: Is it computed with CPU, or some examples use also the GPU? Okay, so let me um, maybe make a clarification about that. So both OpenGL and WebGL use the GPU. They're using the graphics hardware that you have on board. And uh, so WebGL, even in the browser, right, this, this example, right, that was using GP, my GPU on my laptop uh, to render that. Now, some things like JavaScript or application stuff, that might live in the CPU and in the browser thing, right? So if I'm streaming, 
you know, uh, dynamic updates from a server, like a node server somewhere. I'm going to drive that into my X3D scene. You know, it may turn out that array gets really big and I get CPU bound. But that's the browser's JavaScript. It's not the drawing. Pretty much all of the drawing that we're seeing here is, uh, is GPU based. So thank you for that question. <clears throat> uh, there's something important about uh, 3D worlds, uh, especially if you think about the enterprise level. Um, metadata, where did it come from? What am I looking at? Uh, what kinds of uh, algorithms have been run on this data? Right? And so X3D lets you put metadata on any node in the scene, and that's really valuable, uh, as we'll see. Um, it actually opens up a huge uh, world, uh, again, web compatibility, compatibility of standards. If anybody heard Tim Berners-Lee, you know, in the last 15 years, his thing is about the semantic web, okay? It's not just about like doing a search on Bush and you can think of all the different things that come up, but if I do a search on Bush uh, and it gives me the president, you know, one or two, okay, which was so, Semantics lets us disambiguate what's typically a lexical query. And most of our queries these days, frankly, on the, are, are semantic based. Uh, we presented this uh, last year, the spring, uh, in Brussels. Uh, but you could start to ask questions about your object repositories. For example, about how many polygons does a model have? Uh, is something on top of or below something else? Okay. So I see uh, semantic web being a huge uh, way forward and one of the things that's really enabled by standards. Um, definitely check these out if you're going to do uh, you know, HTML5 based X3D. They're both really great uh, software, both actively developed, both open source, and uh, ready to be forked. Okay. Um, I'm gonna fast forward through the next couple of slides because I wanna get to applications and uh, make sure you guys have the slides so that you can uh, follow some of these links yourself. Uh, let's see, lots of tools for the authoring. Uh, I guess I will spend some time on this. So I mentioned Titania. There's also um, X3D Edit, which is a structured editor. You can get X3D out of all kinds of tools, turns out, or VRML, some of the older ones. Uh, but for example, Modo, Blender, Mesh Lab um, have pretty decent support. I'm going to, uh, and then you can also always convert stuff. Um, but incidentally, the PostGIS database uh, natively let, builds X3D for you, if you are interested. Uh, yeah, so most of these work out of the box. Sometimes you'll have to go in and, and change a URL, like because Blender put it at the image texture source as, you know, seek or file colon slash slash slash. You don't want file colon slash slash slash. You want something else. So you, sometimes you have to go into uh, these exports and tweak a thing or two. Um, so Blender 2.82 brings back a lot of the stuff that they broke in 2.8. It wasn't just X3D, it was a lot of exporters and importers. Um, and here's a workaround for getting animations out of Blender. I'm just going to go fast here. Ah, this was a great one. And I want to thank um, HLRS and University of Stuttgart again, Uwe and his team, um, so the Kovais team. They have provided virtually every year for the last, I don't know, 15 or 20, a full on um, uh, exporter for 3D Studio Max. All right, and it's way better than the one that's built in. 
uh, you can do some things like, uh, oh yeah, here we go. It include you know, you can do animations. Uh, there's ways and examples where it'll export things so that you can even, uh, you know, trigger an animation with a touch. So some interaction uh, can be exported with the 3DS. So that's really cool. Uh, uh, Maya has a built-in one, um, or maybe it was retired in 2016, but you can still get it if you want. Otherwise, you're probably going to use OBJ or FBX and convert that downstream to X3D. Okino is great. It's worth the money. You can get from any format to any format. Step, CAD, BIM, you know, uh, FBX, you name it. Uh, FME is a, is a pretty good software also. Okay, so that's the end of that uh, slide. Let's take a second and uh, we'll check our chat and move on to, we've only got 45 minutes left, so I'm having so much fun. <laughs> Uh, I do want to show you guys some things from uh, applications. So let's see, here's uh, applications. And I'll share. All right, hopefully you can see that. All right. So the kind of the point of this last section here <clears throat> is to sort of show you, demonstrate the art of the possible, okay? So here at the Virginia Tech Visionarium, um, the only way I can serve all of our faculty and students in all the different fields and domains with VR is by getting to a greatest common denominator. Okay, and that's X3D. From there, I can uh, put it in the cave, put it on the headset, put it on the web, put it on your phone, okay? Uh, but I can't go and be, um, you know, ask every tool in architecture, for example, to, uh, you know, export this, you know, or you have to change your tool because it won't work. Um, the only way that I can scale my lab to all this content is by using standards. So it's really important to kind of remember that we can pull data from anywhere on the any URL. Uh, and when we're using um, web-based technologies, we can leverage all the goodness that that has, right? So uh, you'll find a lot of examples of using game pads and leaps and so on with web VR, um, well, it's really great. It actually works with um, with X3D and X Freedom too. So I'm going to do this kind of rapid fire because I want to have a little time at the end um, for some more questions. But uh, so, what do we do with X3D at the Visionarium Lab? Well, here's uh, this will be presented this week. Um, we actually, a uh, PhD student here did a study where we actually built a edge of a roof, put it inside the cave, and did an experiment on how people's risk-taking behavior was uh, affected by the different safety interventions. But hello, that world is an X3D world. Okay, so using uh, the models, Again, for research uh, in a reproducible way. Not sure if people know uh, about this, but the United States Navy, every port and facility worldwide is described in an X3D database. So I don't know if you're talking about enterprise 3D, VR, um, the Navy's on it, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's really important because as the sea levels rise, um, they're trying to figure out, you know, can I fit a certain ship in there at a three level tide or with a certain swell? Okay. 
So terrain, BIM models, ships, vehicles, all kinds of stuff um, is an enterprise database for the Navy and commanders and control can be, uh, you know, uh, can then discuss through this kind of like whiteboard, web-based whiteboard feature. Uh, should we do it this way? Should we do it that way? Oops, red circle and arrow, there's an issue. Okay. So the Navy knows that its facilities and its ships are going to last longer than any Silicon Valley game company. Okay. That's why they went for X3D and the ISO standard. Um, I was going to have a guest uh, in this um, uh, tutorial, also sponsored by 3DMD, whose headquarters is in Atlanta. If you are at um, Rutling in 2018 and you went to the Max Planck Institute, you saw some of their scanners, um, body scanners, high resolution in time, high resolution in space. Um, they uh, are members of the Web3D Consortium and you know they needed a solution, uh, which was how to hold all of this data, how to authenticate it and keep it safe so that you know, um, your uh, health data can't be um, used. Okay, so let's keep going. Uh, molecules, we love molecules. Um, some of the first 3D graphics, right, were done with <clears throat> molecules. Here's a couple of tools that support the export of uh, Web 3D. Uh, we can see this one here. So this is 2008. I can actually load this up on my uh, uh, cave here in, in a second. But let's go to uh, actually NIH, 3dprint.nih.gov. I'd like to show you another example of Enterprise X3D. All right. So uh, I was lucky enough to... Um, be part of the advisory board for this project and as you know there's lots of tools that already support the ISO standards I'm gonna to go to create and I'm gonna look here maybe about uh, some proteins and let's do like a search for uh, COVID how about search 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 Oh yeah, okay, so it looks like a couple people, including myself, um, have uploaded some of the proteins for the COVID virus. So let's see what happens here. So everybody knows about 3D printing. It's, it's uh, at least for additive manufacturing, they're typically using a STL or something, stereolithography format. STL is a really dumb format. It's very old, it's very simple, and it does not uh, allow you to have things like metadata and color. Uh, of course, VRML and X3D do. So uh, when we have color printers, in the, uh, this is the reason why we want to be able to give them an X3D file to print instead of an STL. And incidentally, that's exactly what the NIH did. They realized, hey, we need a greatest common denominator. It's going to be X3D. We'll let people download, uh, you know, the STL if they need it, but also the color version of that model. I should um, mention, actually, that uh, with the NIH 3D Print Exchange, when you enter a model, all these little um, hydrogen bonds, they're not necessarily part of the 3D. They're just um, inserted so that um, when you print it, the molecule doesn't just fall apart and collapse. So it's actually about rigidity. Those uh, bonds are, um, are added. Okay. So there's all kinds of stuff in the 3D print exchange. Um, you know, CAD models to make your app put your phone onto a microscope, um, prosthetics, hands, all kinds of things that you can print yourself. And um, 
What's been neat is that uh, Cura, NetFab, and Shapeways all support X3D for 3D printing because you want to have color uh, for certain parts of your model. Okay. So again, looking at that ISO standard, the greatest common denominator, and saying, hey, you know, I need a, I need this to be able to run with lots of different tools, and it's got to be able to run for a decade or more. Uh, I like this one. Uh, I thought there was a, a link on here, but uh, I wanted to bring this up because a lot of people, you know, might use MATLAB or something. This is uh, an undergraduate in my lab. Uh, he was taking some flight control, uh, flight trajectory data out of MATLAB, and um, he basically put it into X3D so that we could look at it um, in the cave and, and on the web. Okay, so it was talking about control algorithms. It's basically, uh, you know, he was doing it in MATLAB, but to look at the results, uh, where you, same as Simulink connects with the um, Web3D runtime. Okay, uh, we've run our cave actually from, uh, from a cluster across campus on the 10 gig line. If you're interested in scientific visualization, especially with Paraview, you can dig into that. Paraview is a great tool, uh, and it supports X3D export. Um, this summer, we did uh, a project with Jefferson National Lab. A lot of their products are, um, all the products are X3D. Uh, here's one, uh, again, it's about integrating with existing tools. So here in the nuclear engineering community, they're talking about safety of radioactive waste. They're running simulations all the time, uh, but they're usually running them from the command line, right? And then using all kinds of different tools to look at them. Well, we made a web interface for them. And uh, that lets you, for example, move um, these different casings around in the pool and see if it's, uh, if it keeps the um, uh, material cool, for example. And um, that would, uh, someone might recognize Halden, uh, Norway here. That's a 1998 uh, thermal model that we used uh, to put the simulation results in. And that's all in the web browser and through, uh, through a web service, talking back to a server that runs the simulation. Um, I'll talk about 3D Blacksburg for just a few minutes. Uh, this is an ongoing project. It's really helped us bring in all kinds of stakeholders into VR. Um, and so it's really exciting uh, to do this. I mean, it takes a lot of different kinds of data to mash up, right? We're getting GIS databases from the town, you know, uh, the state, the federal government, uh, local architecture students giving us SketchUp models. The campus has its own uh, set of layers. But once you mash them up, you can start to do really cool things. Uh, this was a master's thesis um, a few years ago, 2017, I guess, where we redesigned a whole new alleyway with a walkway, and we we're trying to talk about urban density. Of course, the only way to tell is to put someone on the sidewalk in front of the building and uh, get them to talk about it. So we actually had town planners come in and uh, do an immersive session. If uh, there's a paper on this, if you want to uh, read more about it, I think it's linked later. Uh, here we are on the Appalachian Trail. Uh, the Appalachian Nature Conservancy gave us a couple of maps and some new uh, trail paths. And we wanted to, again, group collaborative planning uh, or spatial development. Here we're going out to a, a well-known overlook over the New River. Uh, I mentioned the exhibit design. That's been a great one. But also we've been working with foresters and landscape people. Uh, they'll go out uh, with a class. They'll take a 360 picture of an environment and then they'll go in and say well let's plant some flowers over here and this kind of species there put them back 
uh, into the video sphere. And then you can have this uh, collaborative discussion uh, about the design. So here's some more examples. Uh, this one is uh, I used a handheld scanner and photospheres, and we uh, put that together. Um, I think that's linked later on also. Yeah, so here's some links if you wanted. There's the stuff about uh, urban density and some links. We did a fairly um, uh, intensive model of our art center. And uh, we, uh, I guess it was modeled mostly in Maya, and then we pulled it out to X3D and made it uh, multi-user with a node.js web server. So there's a little bit about that if you wanted to see it. Um, getting terrain and uh, other data out is not obvious, especially when companies like Esri sort of want to lock you in. Uh, to their workflows, but we found lots of open ways to get GIS data uh, and analytic results out of these systems and into VR. Uh, 3D Blacksburg is kind of like the main example of that. Um, you can see you're running it on a multi-touch display uh, or on the desktop. Um, since it's an X3D environment, we can bring in video streams. So here's webcams from campus coming in real time into the 3D environment. And uh, we can also make it multi-user. So yeah, back in 2012, um, we uh, supported a sort of a, a collaborative um, version of 3D Blacksburg. And that would use the Deep Matrix uh, server. So there's the multi-user shared campus. You have chat windows, avatars, et cetera, et cetera. Great. Um, inside buildings, there's lots of stuff we might want to visualize, like, for example, Wi-Fi radio signals. Um, so here's a, an example called from Cornet. It's a radio test bed here on campus. You click on a radio in the building, and it'll send you the stream of its activity in a 3D, X3D uh, chart. Um, here's that version of our sustainability center. Uh, here we use uh, LIDAR to um, locate our tree models. We use different levels of detail for the tree models and uh, then evaluated that uh, with users. We fly drones all the time. Uh, we get last data from these drones. I've written a very simple, literally like, 40 line Python script to go from last to X3D. And uh, incidentally, that brings down, um, uh, makes this kind of data uh, deliverable on, uh, on the web. So you can link to some of these uh, examples if you want. Uh, we're using web shaders, sort of like you might see at Poetry. Um, I don't know if this will work. Yeah, it looks pretty good. So here's. Um, an example from the point cloud. Um, but you know, with points, uh, stuff in the foreground. Oops, let's go. Let's go work. I think I might be on the wrong. Oh, there we go. Um, so you can attenuate the size based on distance, etc. And um, <clears throat> That's a matter of, again, being able to use a shader in my uh, WebGL environment. Uh, there's another case study. I'm going to keep going. Case study. Oh, we did, um, we do trainings. So we're an extension, a land grant university. So we do trainings for our extension agents every year. And, uh, you know, we can't bust them everywhere uh, in the world or in the state even. So we prime them by taking them to these remote site visits in the cube. And then uh, um, their time spent on site is much more uh, productive. There's some tours. This one is kind of fun. I guess we looked at this before. 
So here's a bunch of photospheres down in the site. I'm using page up and page down, remember, to hop to different viewpoints. And um, so here we are at the nut grove. I'm going to use my page down. Here we are at uh, the shiitake logs. These are scanned with a handheld scanner. Again, trying to be able to uh, tell, teach people about the, the site and the different kinds of um, forest farming that can be done under the canopy. So let's go over to find uh, Professor Munsell. Yeah, here's the one. I, I love this one. So you saw a screenshot of this, but you know we're inside a photosphere, and uh, we're putting a 3D model in it. So this is actually the same day. Oops, sorry, the same day um, we captured Dr. Munsell as he's counting his ramps. Right there, ladies and gentlemen, he loves his ramps. Okay, so you can start to imagine that you know. We can get any kind of data into an X3D world. Um, here's a whole another bunch of examples. Um, I guess I like some of these from CAD. These are uh, CAD examples. Let me see. I'll just load this. Here we're using Excite. So here you get a CAD example. Um, I can rotate it depending on what angle I look at. I'm actually seeing the technical specs of the drawing. Okay. Kind of cool. So uh, K-Shell is, is well known for uh, being able to bring CAD and step data into X3D. Um, how does this thing disassemble? Well, let's see. Um, you can click it and get the animation of the disassembly. Okay, so CAD, this is great. Um, love this group. This is, uh, again, uh, one of the great things about using standards is that innovation comes from the most unlikely places. Here's a lean mean uh, startup called Elfel, uh, who basically put all of their camera models online as X3D. Uh, but they also um, have this viewer where the results from those stereo cameras get uh, produced in X3D. So definitely click on this. Uh, maybe I'll set that going in the background because it's, it's pretty wild. All right. Keep going. Um, <clears throat> VR for the masses. Okay. Last year we did a X3DOM uh, video sphere study with students from all around the country to get them into uh, VR and have them counting trout. So here's a photosphere from underwater. Uh, they're looking at sampling techniques. So I, sometimes I just watch this just to relax. Uh, but it's actually science. So again, photospheres video spheres uh, delivered through the web and uh, we got over 3,500 3, observations students. So here's uh, what comes out of that camera. It's kind of cool. You can see um, it gives me a map of where I am, but it's reconstructed the, de the depth of this scene uh, and they're delivering it in X3D. So that's kind of a cool Cool result from Elfel. Fast forward networks. We've done that. Uh, I want to spend a little time on this because this is probably the or what, two more things. Let's go to zbbrowser.com. And I wanted to uh, just mention a couple things about this application. Uh, make sure that we're still seeing this. Yes. So this was an undergraduate summer project at NIH. And if you tell me that X3D is too hard or too complicated, I just point you to what my undergraduates have done, okay? Any self-respecting software engineer 
who's a professional should be able to do this too. Okay, but let's talk about what we got. We have um, the zebrafish. We're looking at different gene expression lines. We've got a 3D volumetric rendering of the fish, um, a scan of the, of the fish. We can move um, our crosshairs and look at any view. We can go into VR if we wanted. Uh, but let's say we wanted to look at the gene expression of a couple of these lines. So the first one is this green. You can see there's uh, this gene is expressed in certain parts of the nervous system. Maybe I could uh, add a little more uh, brightness to that. You can really see it pop out. So I've got sliders. I'm doing volume rendering in the browser. This is an X3D scene. Maybe I'll turn up the red contrast a little bit. You can see that too. Okay. Incidentally, in the authoring slide set, there are some specifics about how to do volume rendering with X3D. Uh, if you're interested in something like that, definitely go ahead and, um, and look at those. So I can also, you know, turn on or off different anatomical landmarks. So again, 2D and 3D working together. We have a full featured volume rendering and analytic platform right in the web page. Okay. Um, so yeah, and there's some nice features like you can download your view and the stack and share it. Um, so I encourage folks to take a look at how we do volume rendering in X3D and kind of, uh, again, to sort of share with you the art of the possible, it's all X3D. Okay. Um, we've done it with a bunch of other kinds of volume data. Um, turns out that uh, Professor Hoffman and Bond has published like all of his weird zoological specimens in uh, X3D volumes. It's very cool. You should check this one out too if you get a chance. Um, okay. Uh, heritage. A lot of action going on with um, 3D models and publishing. So uh, I thought I could um, share a few of these. Um, this one specifically because we were just working on it. But we had the, we have this insect collection, and uh, we have photogrammetry. We have captured them. Um, we publish them to X3D so we can have this preview, we can have web VR, um, and we can also load different resolutions of the data. So you can see here there's a lot of metadata that's got to travel with the model. But we can also, um, you know, step up the geometry and the texture resolution, again, just using radio buttons. In the web page. All right, cool. Um, you'll find a great export from MATLAB and R. Maya VI uh, also has a, a save figure um, feature. Let's take a look at this one and then uh, I think we'll pop ahead. So I'm looking at this NIST uh, library of mathematical functions. Mm, I don't know. Let's go to see if I can find some of these. Uh, I'm looking for graphs. Uh, uh, let's go up to elementary functions. How about um, I'm looking for anything here that's got a uh, 3D on it. Let's see. Because NIST provides previews. There we go. Um, yeah. So like this one. Uh, 3D preview of the function. Um, I can do, you know, have different color maps for it. Um, change my viewpoint. Uh, I like this, which is um, what they did is they let you do a cutting plane. And then they show you the cross section here. So you can see the cross section changes as it sweeps through the space. 
Okay. Interactive function visualization all in the web browser with X3D. Okay. All right, so we've only got a little bit of time left. I'm gonna use this last couple of minutes to um, load up a few things um, behind me and I'll check the, check the chat. But I'm hoping that uh, throughout all of this, you guys say, oh wow, I had never heard of uh, XCD or VRML. I didn't know it could do that. Oh, I didn't know I could run a cave on with X3D or a headset or a hollow lens. We sure can. And the cool thing is that that content and logic um, written in an ISO standard is very is much more durable than any of the alternatives. Obviously, um, you know, FBX, they change that every year. Okay, so let's see. I've got, um, uh, let's see. One more deck, uh, I, although I'm not gonna, I don't really want to spend too much more time on that. I want to, here we go, authoring. Uh, maybe what I could do is I'll just show you a couple of quick um, highlights from this one. So let's see. Yeah. <clears throat> so I'm gonna, I'm gonna fast forward here. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff about the scene graph itself, okay? But you can read the book. You can control you the examples. You'll figure it out. Um, shaders, animation, sensors. Uh, physics. Okay, so here's a couple of things from uh, Dr. Vosner and HLRS. And I really just kind of want to want to run through these slides kind of quickly to sort of show you the art of the possible. And again, you know their 3DS Max exporter. It's pretty good, okay? But if you take the philosophy of putting as much functionality at the system level as you can, keeping the application level uh, simple, uh, you can quickly start to find that you can use this with all kinds of data and applications. So CAD, uh, PDB, all right, so at CalI2, they're running Kovas. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, take scans, mesh it, put it out to X3D, show it with simulation results. Uh, Stuttgart 21, so you're coming from a planning tool, again, out to an immersive uh, interactive rendering. Again, group reviews, um, architects, HVAC people, contractors, building information modeling. Fuse it, get it to X3D, and go immersive. Um, so here again, this is all from HLRS, and uh, they should get some credit for um, all the amazing work that they do here. All right, so often, I think this is getting close. Yeah, so there's some other stuff about um, volume rendering a little bit later, Python uh, notebooks, but, <clears throat> Uh, we've we've kind of done all of these, and I just wanted to lift them up as a strategy, which is, okay, um, I've got a CSV file, I want to make some X3D out of it, or reproject. So I'm just writing scripts with Perl and Python. You know, you've seen what an X3D file looks like. It's not that hard. Um, and uh, so programmatic generation and conversion can be really useful. Um, the last thing, I guess I will do this is to let you guys know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna load up a couple of things on um, our queue behind me. And uh, if you are interested in sort of some of the issues around setting up window geometry, tracking streams, uh, at least with instant reality and AR tool, um, AR tracking, uh, you're welcome to take a look at uh, our scripts of how we're doing it. And I think um, 
what I'm going to do is share another screen with you guys and show you how we run our cave with X3D content. So let me show this here. So we have a, um, a web-based launcher. I'm actually here able to uh, get in. Oh, I shouldn't let you see it by the passcode, but that's all right. It'll change soon. And I'm going to fire up <clears throat> the system. And we have a whole bunch of uh, examples that we can run. I can control them here from this web page. I thought it might be fun to show the presentation that I did from Immersive Analytics uh, Workshop 2016. We're going to let the projectors warm up. And um, I will quick take some questions while that is warming up. So let's see. So I have a question. Um, what do you think of other WebXR frameworks like A-Frame and Babylon? OK. <clears throat> so that's a great, great question. Um, so they do make some things easy. Uh, like A-Frame, I think, is um, is quite handy and, and able to um, especially do it with, with Web VR. But let me just talk about the difference first. Um, Web VR was a recommendation and is implemented in, in lots of the browsers. What they're working on now is Web XR, which is much more complicated. Um, in the sense that they're having to deal with compositing, they're having to deal with permissions for the camera on your phone, et cetera. Um, so I think they both have great um, potential. Um, again, I don't want to have to rewrite some JavaScript code every time I want my car wheel to spin or my door to open. But right now, in those frameworks that don't support X3D, that's what I have to do, right? I have to recode that every time in a JavaScript piece of logic. Because um, it's not in the OBJ I'm loading, right? Um, so I think they're, they're great. I would just love to see them play well with others. Um, and I think WebXR is definitely um, maturing. They're, they're still meeting almost uh, a week, um, definitely monthly, but maybe weekly. So I like both of those. Um, in, uh, toolkits, and um, I think they have some some good potential. All right, so I just launched a uh, environment here. This is an X3D model behind me um, from. Let's see. Um, I've got head tracking. Uh, I've got my navigation. So, because I wanted to be able to, uh, we're in stereo mode, so it's probably a little bit blurry for you guys. Actually, I probably should have done this in mono. Um, but here's the PowerPoint slides set that I presented in the workshop. Uh, I have the logic here of where I could uh, you know, go forward and back in my slides. And this is a regular X3D model. I'm starting my animations just with a touch sensor. So I'm right now I'm touching it as a raycast with this wand, right? But um, I could also do another way where I have to actually intersect the wand with the thing. Like for example, if I was using a doorknob or something. Okay, so I did nothing to this X3D file to make it immersive, except for uh, I loaded it here with our extensions, uh, our screen geometry, and our interaction devices. OK. So going from your phone to a 27 million pixel stereo display, it's the same file. I didn't recompile anything. Um, I do 
uh, need to look out at the application layer and consider, you know, does the user interface make sense? Um, certain kinds of interactions uh, make sense in here, but don't on the Google Cardboard, right? So uh, that those are the kinds of things that um, are considered at the application design level. But when I'm talking about the functionality of this slide deck, forward and back, clicking, that doesn't change. That's the abstract behavior and interaction of this 3D world described in the ISO standard. It's portable and um, has been running, uh, you know, 22 years and going strong uh, with this content. So it's been a real treat to uh, have the morning with you guys. And I hope that um, you've learned something, maybe gotten some perspective about what's possible um, with these ISO standards. There is a, as I said, there's an international community here. Uh, if you go to web3d.org and uh, you join a mailing list like, uh, oops, sorry. Uh, and you join a mailing list like uh, x3d-public at web3d.org. You can ask questions. Hey, this thing isn't working. You know, post an example. Um, back in the day, that's you know really how I learned um, uh, this technology. Um, obviously, the open source code bases have their own um, issue trackers on GitHub and so on. So you can always ping uh, someone there, uh, ask your questions. Uh, you'll find out that there's lots of knowledge um, and distributed all around the world. And when you start to see things like vSLAM pop up and, hey, you know, there's a new device and now there's X3D supported on it. Or, oh, um, you work on the web, so you can actually encrypt and authenticate all your 3D content. Yeah, these are these are big, big advantages, big issues, and um, I'm hoping that uh, we'll see you guys online and uh, in the next VR conference, uh, wherever that may be. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and um, I hope that you will. Feel free to contact me and the Web3D Consortium, which is where all of this excitement happens. Mm. Well, thank you guys. I'm gonna hang for a little bit longer. We do have a few minutes. I'm sure it's not like a physical room that they'll just uh, kick us off, but um, the webinar goes till noon and that, that might be the cutoff. But it's been great. Um, definitely follow those links in, uh, in those slide sets. You'll find all kinds of examples. Control U, view the source, uh, and you'll see how it's done, what's going on under the hood. So I'll look for any more um, comments. Okay, thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Jure. Thank you, Christina. That's great. Ah, okay, we got a question here about 3JS in relationship to X3D. So yeah, 3JS is you know another one of those JavaScript polyfills. Um, you are often starting with an inactive model like an OBJ or something, and then adding the animation and logic interaction programmatically with your JavaScript. It turns out there is an X3D and a vermal loader for 3JS. Uh, the vermal loader is built into 3JS. The X3D loader, um, I think I linked it in the slide deck, um, but it basically uses JSON um, to uh, take a JSON encoding of X3D and push it into 3JS. Um, so yes, they they can work together. They should work better together. Um, but there's you can definitely load X3D and Vermal in 3JS, at least geometry. Uh, whether or not it's smart about 
sensors and interaction, um, we'd have to we'd have to test that some more. Great. Yes. Um, so I'm pretty sure I did link that in uh, the slide deck. It's probably in the authoring section four. But um, so have fun with X3D. Have fun with VRML. Um, and uh, you know this will be uh, your content will still be running in 20, 30 years, even after the next wave of bankruptcies and uh, closings and mergers and whatever content is king and uh, that's why standards are so important um, so i hope you'll join me in uh, building new worlds on the web and thanks so much ah okay here we've got another question uh, about the compatibility of different 3D formats. <clears throat> yeah, well, so we we have a tendency to um, get uh, a little blinded uh, by the tools that we're used to working in. And of course, it seems totally normal that uh, an, an FBX standard file format should uh, change every year. <laughs> uh, I, I don't believe that. We need to have all of the above, okay? We need to have that front end innovation, but it's also gotta be built on some common value, um, which is where X3D lives. And if I thought about um, its relationship, also we mentioned a bit about um, GLTF. Okay, there's a link to my blog uh, in the slide deck, which explains this a little bit more. Hey man, GLTF is great. It's lean and mean, it's good at what it does. I don't have to parse that big bag of coordinates, just give it to the GPU. I don't want those coordinates in my DOM tree anyway in the web browser. I don't want to parse them, it takes too long. So there are good things. Now, of course, the challenge is GLTF is trying to add everything on top of it. And so, you know, we're going to see if they're not careful, it'll be the same thing that happened to Collada is going to happen to GLTF, which is it started as something very specific solved that problem really well and then everybody wanted to put the kitchen sink on there and it got so top heavy that it became useless um collados that way and i'm afraid OpenGL, unless they stop pretty soon uh well that will happen too but in terms of that core value of it um that's great you know use a pbr model uh, but you're going to want to have some defined interaction. They want to define lighting uh, and some other things that just aren't in the GLTF format. So that's why it kind of makes sense to live a level above that when you're building your application. And again, once it's in that X3D file, I can load it in any of those engines, just like an HTML is loaded in any of those browsers. Um, and then I can take advantage of them, right? Web VR, Instant Reality, Castle Game Engine, VSLAM, same content, um, but now I can run it on the HoloLens or on the cardboard or all of this kind of stuff. So um, I think it's part of my sort of philosophy, and a lot of the people that have, have built this, Fraunhofer and HLRS uh, and other Navy. NIH, all of these big enterprises uh, are really trying to make it easy to build applications. And that means that we want to make that system layer as robust as possible. And that's where the standards come in. Um, the standard is openly published. So if you go to web3d.org or any of those links, you can see the IDL um, that constitutes our unified object model and that gives us the auto generation capability so for all of those different encodings and uh, language bindings um, remember 
same X3D file. I just had to make the mapping, my application specific mapping of units, um, making sure that uh, also my rotations are in radians, uh, Euler angles, and not in heading pitch roll, right? So there's a few kind of conversions that are important to make these devices work and work, you know, naturally or as expected. Um, but uh, it's not it's not rocket science. It's it's barely computer science actually. Um, and I think that's really what we're hoping for is that people get to focus on the application, the informatics of it. So web web developers, you know, web services. Um, and uh, don't have to worry about all of that um, hairy stuff under the hood that we computer science people love to think about. Great. Well, I really enjoyed this. Um, we're coming, they, they haven't kicked us out yet, so that's a good sign. Um, let's see if there's any other um, questions in the last minute here. So yeah, we're running our cave um, basically through this web interface and it lets us launch uh, uh, different worlds. So that, yeah, even we have students coming in here who don't know anything about a command line, they can load their model and run it uh, here. Great. Well, hey, y'all, please uh, feel free to reach out and contact me. Um, this has been a lot of fun, and I hope, um, hope you learned something. I'm going to uh, spread the a link to the PowerPoints around. They'll also be published, um, I'm sure, somewhere with this conference or on web3d.org. So really appreciate your attention and um, today and your questions, especially too. All right. Well, thanks so much. Uh, we'll catch you guys at one of the other um, great events for this uh, conference. Thanks. Take care.